Hi, my name is Dr. Padilla. I'm a professor in computer science and psychology, and I've been a faculty member for over five years and in academia for a much longer time than that. I have my tea out today because I thought I'd sit and have a little chat with you about something that definitely affects me and may be affecting you as well, which is imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is something that really impacts the vast majority of academics, but it's something we don't talk about a great deal. So I thought I would share with you my experiences about imposter syndrome, how I deal with imposter syndrome, and some things that you might consider if you're struggling with it yourself. Okay, so first of all, what is imposter syndrome? It is the subjective feeling that you are inadequate, you're not smart enough, or you're incapable of performing in some type of fashion. And that is counter to the evidence otherwise. So that basically means that you can feel like you aren't good enough or smart enough to have your job or be in your position, or that everyone might see that you are an imposter at some point, that you're tricky or fooling everyone, and somehow they're going to find out and all of the sudden, you know, you'll be outed to your colleagues and your friends. Now, this is an incredibly personal experience, but it is something that the vast majority of people in academia experience. Often when I talk to colleagues about this, every single person in the room agrees that they feel inadequate or they're not as smart as their colleagues and in some capacity have this imposter syndrome. I know that I have it a great deal. I am in a department where I have a, a dual appointment in computer science and psychology and my PhD is from cognitive neuroscience. So it's very challenging to switch from cognitive neuroscience to a computer science department in part because all of my colleagues are so brilliant. They are phenomenal, they're intelligent, they're witty, they're fun, their work is so high quality and I feel honored to um, be working with them and I often feel inadequate. Um, so how do I deal with it? Well. One of the first things that I think about with imposter syndrome is that everyone feels it. Truly, truly everyone. If someone says they don't feel imposter syndrome, then they're probably a narcissist, honestly. And I know some of the most famous professors in my field, and they all have it too. So when I'm feeling like I don't belong or in some ways I'm not smart enough to, to do the work or be um, affiliated with certain individuals. I think about that, how they are feeling the same thing at that very moment, potentially about me, which is wild, <laughs> but it's true. It's true. You only see the surface. You see what people present to you. You don't hear their internal dialogue of um, how they might feel insecurities or they might be nervous about a particular aspect of their work. You only see what they present. And oftentimes in academia, um, people have a very good presentation, but that might not be the full story. They might be feeling the same types of feelings. So it's really good to acknowledge that you are certainly not alone. In fact, you're in very good company. Some of the most brilliant minds feel imposter syndrome as well. The next thing that helps me deal with imposter syndrome is knowing that generally there's very little evidence that in fact you do not belong. Wherever you're at, in any stage of your career, if you were there, you belong there. You wouldn't have gotten there if you didn't truly belong there. There's no way to sneak in or somehow get there because you didn't earn it. Truth is, is that you've earned to be there and so you get to be there and that is okay. You can feel confident that you are there for a reason and now that you're in that position, um, you're going to be as successful as you allow yourself to be. And oftentimes a really good strategy to combat imposter syndrome is to think of counterfactuals. So the strategy we often use in psychology, which is thinking of all of the evidence to counter your negative thoughts. So you might be in a room with seemingly brilliant people and think, I, I don't belong here. I'm not smart enough. But then you think, okay, well, actually, in fact, I got an undergraduate degree and I did really well on these exams and, you know, think of all of the evidence to the contrary. And the more you get in the practice of 
thinking about that evidence, pulling it up as soon as you start to get these imposter syndrome-like feelings in your mind um, that will really help you counteract the kind of imposter syndrome spiral that you might be going through. So thinking about counterfactuals. Um, another thing you can do if that's really hard for you is to have an imposter syndrome buddy. I love doing this um, for, for my good friends because I love their research. So what you can do is if you're ever feeling imposter syndrome, you might set up an imposter syndrome buddy that can help you with those counterfactuals. You might not be able to think of all the great things about your work, or you might not think your work is great, <laughs> but I bet your friends and colleagues do. If you ask me to name 10 amazing things about any of my colleagues, I could easily pull it up because I know how fantastic their work is and how important it is and how well they do it. I don't know if they would be willing to say the same thing about their work. So it can be very helpful to recruit an imposter syndrome buddy that can be there for you if you need a little pep talk <laughs> about um, you know, why in fact you deserve to be there. And that can be very, very useful. If you can start thinking of that imposter syndrome buddy, what you can potentially do is be your own buddy. Imagine that you had to describe your research as if you were your friend. What would your friend say about your research? And sometimes that can help you think of those counterfactuals about how your work is good and how you do belong to be there. If you're pretending to be someone else who is advocating or talking about your research, um, that is another strategy that I've used that is very successful. Another strategy I often use is to do your best to not compare yourself to others. And I know that is so hard, and I do my best, and I often fall prey to it um, a great deal. But as soon as you're starting to compare yourself to others, try to reframe it and compare yourself to yourself. Take where you were four, five, six years ago, even last year, and say, how much have I improved since then? Me compared to past me is killing it. And that can really reframe your journey, and you can look at your journey as independent, not in comparison. Because there's lots of behind the scene reasons why people might be on the surface doing better on all these metrics than you might be. For example, you might see a colleague publish 10 papers that year. That seems amazing, right? And then you might feel like, oh, I need to publish that many papers. What am I going to do? What you might not have known is that colleague might not have published any papers the previous three years because all of their projects were in process and they all just happened to coalesce at the same time and be published. You don't get that backstory. You don't get the history. You just see what they have presented. So comparing yourself to other people is kind of comparing apples to oranges in the sense that you don't know their journey. You don't know where they've come from and the things that, that have put them in certain situations. Um, so comparing yourself to yourself is a good baseline to see how much you improved. And then you can celebrate that. The next thing that I find useful is to develop a personalized coping strategy. Now, I'm not gonna recommend you to do mine because it's very personal, um, but whatever it is, when you're starting to feel those feelings of doubt, um, like you don't belong, it's very useful if you can have your own coping strategy or trigger that helps you kind of reframe this. For me, it's that I had a lot of speaking anxiety when I'd get up in front of big crowds. And uh, so much so that the first time I was presenting research as a graduate student, the advisor that I was working with she saw my talk and it was so bad. She made me go to a speaking coach <laughs> because I was doing that poorly. Um, so I do get a great deal of anxiety in speaking in front of big crowds. Now, the way I overcome it is I have a little playlist that hypes me up. <laughs> and um, there are always these songs that are very like uplifting <laughs> that can help me get out of this mindset of kind of panic and fear and seeing all of these really smart people judging me. Um, so I like to run to the restroom, put my headphones in, listen to that little song, and that can kind of put me in the right mind frame before I do something big. I don't know what yours is, but it's very useful if you can identify something that helps you break out of the pattern of kind of dread and spiral um, that can help you, you know, be the best version of yourself. Um, and then you can be truly proud of what you've done, of your performance in any capacity, independent of how you're comparing or what other people think. For me, I feel the best when I'm proud of myself. So I try to make sure that in everything that I do, I'm proud of what I've done and what I've produced. 
Does that mean that I'm good, as good as my colleague? No, they're going to be much better than me at many different things. But what I've done and I've produced, I'm proud of. And so that is a way that I can reframe these comparisons and um, find a way to be proud by finding my own little behavioral triggers <laughs> that can get me um, away from that fear spiral that's often associated with imposter syndrome. Hi, I'm Dr. Padilla from a little bit later. Okay, so you might have noticed that I had a light in the background and part of what was happening was it was changing the color in the video. The last part of this video got blown out so I needed to re-record it. Okay, so I go to re-record it and I'm moving a candle and uh, I did this to my outfit that I was wearing in the video. And I thought that I couldn't not show this ridiculous fail in a video about imposter syndrome because now I also feel like an imposter YouTuber, right? I can't even, you know, manage to finish out a video. But in any case, I wanted to close this video by saying that if no one has told you recently, you do matter and you absolutely belong. I fail all of the time and I'm always worried that my colleagues and the people on the internet and everywhere else is going to realize that I'm an imposter but I'm here and I belong here <laughs> to some degree you can see me trying to tell myself as I say that um, but you know we belong here and your contributions are important and you're smart enough and you're good enough and you can do what you set your mind out to do. So I hope that this video has helped in some capacity. I feel like it's almost helped me process my own imposter syndrome. If you have any other questions or if you would like different types of professional development videos, please comment down below. I'm always happy to talk about these concepts. They affect me a great deal. And I've had lots of conversations with my other colleagues about this as well. Um, so hopefully it helped you. Thank you for watching this video and take care.